Excellency, my colleagues from the UN family, diplomats present, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. And first of all, let me thank you all profusely for coming here on a, on a national holiday. Greatly appreciated that you were able to make the time to, to join us this, uh, this afternoon. So um, I'm honored to, to welcome uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs and his wife, Sonia, who Jeffrey Sachs doesn't need too much of an introduction. I think he's pretty well known. But suffice it to say that he's also the United Nations Secretary General's SDG advocate and has worked successively with the previous Secretary General, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and has as well as with, with Kofi Annan. An illustrious economist uh, and uh, a policymaker, a man who has a vision of transformation, like me, shares a passionate heart about Africa, really believes in the real potential of where Africa can be, but also someone who brings in a, a particular perspective which challenges orthodoxy. And he turns many ways uh, orthodoxy on its head. And myself as a student of, in Princeton University, I would often refer to a lot of his writings in my own policy papers, which, which I would uh, you know, look at. So for me, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege that today we've had the opportunity of hosting um, um, a true visionary in the development sphere, a man who uh, both addresses it with great intellect, but with a particular passion, a passion in the heart and a drive, a missionary zeal of, of the kind of social transformation he wants to see happen in the world. So with that, uh, Jeff, let me take this opportunity to welcome you, whichever way you would like to take this, but everybody's eagerly looking forward to hearing from you. How do we rescue the SDG, given the fact that the Secretary General just hosted the Sustainable Development Goals Summit and the Climate Summit in New York. Welcome. Okay. Great. Sid, thank you so much. And uh, ambassadors, uh, friends, uh, UN country team uh, members, it's a really great privilege and a great delight to be together. So thank you. And thank you for coming on a holiday, a, a wonderful holiday. So let me wish everybody a happy autumn festival. And um, thank you for being here today. Uh, we have, uh, Sonia and I have uh, been here for uh, the last week for a number of meetings. Uh, a, a very wonderful meeting uh, that I'll uh, discuss um, of GuideCo, which is uh, a Chinese initiative that I hope uh, everybody knows for global energy interconnection. Uh, it's an extremely important initiative on how to make the energy transformation. And it's an example in my view of China's real leadership in global sustainable development, a real gift for the world. And then we just uh, had a birthday party yesterday. We celebrated Confucius's birthday party yesterday uh, in uh, Shufu uh, at the Nishan Forum for World Civilizations. And this was, uh, of course, quite an impressive event. Um, and also very moving because the Confucius Temple, uh, if you have not been there, um, is 2,500 years old. Uh, at Confucius's death, uh, he already was uh, an esteemed teacher. And so the lands of the Kong family were preserved as a little temple, but then the emperors over uh, many dynasties and uh, two millennia continued to build new uh, centers and temples in what would become a grand complex. And what is extraordinary about it is that it shows the continuity of Chinese civilization over a period of 2,500 years because emperor after emperor saw fit to honor this sage 
whose teachings and then through many, many generations of students and uh, followers uh, built a philosophical uh, base that actually underpins so much of China's culture until today. So it's quite remarkable. I don't think there are many places in the world like Shufu. Uh, it's hard to think of any others, in fact, where you've had continuity of 2,500 years of political recognition of a body of thought. It, I, I actually don't know of uh, many, many other places uh, like that or none comes to mind. So it's always uh, impressive and moving to be in China. And um, I'm very grateful for the chance. We are just at the uh, end of the meeting a couple of weeks ago at the UN on the SDGs. So that's where I'd like to start our discussion, but we can uh, also discuss any other topics and issues that you would like, because we have such a wonderful assembly of uh, world leading diplomats. Uh, this was the midpoint of what is to be a 15 year journey of the sustainable development goals. And uh, so there was a, a stock taking as well as the normal high level debate uh, uh, at, uh, at the General Assembly. And I think it's fair to say two things. One, there was a political declaration that was made by all 193 UN member states, uh, the same as those that adopted the SDGs in the first place, that the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals remains at the center of the world agenda for building a better future. And this is good because one can imagine with all of the tensions and distractions and crises that uh, maybe by midpoint, uh, some governments would have said, we're done with this. This makes no sense. How did we get on this path? But there's no feeling like that anywhere in in my experience also, not only last week, but as I travel around the world, the notion of the SDGs as a useful framework for national policy, local policy, regional cooperation at the level of ASEAN or level of the African Union or other regional groupings, uh, and at the global level remains very strong. It's actually a complicated agenda. So it's taken governments many, many years even to figure out what are we supposed to do with these 17 goals and these 169 targets and these 312 indicators. But it did not lead to cynicism or neglect. Actually, the agenda is a rather wonderful agenda ending extreme poverty, ending hunger, uh, achieving universal health coverage, achieving universal education coverage. You can't argue with it uh, in the sense that these are really important and they have been well identified and the governments did a good job in coming up with this list, which I thought was way too long at the beginning because I strongly recommended 10 goals I said on the Moses principle, you could get the Ten Commandments on two tablets, uh, but um, we have three and a half tablets at least. Uh, but it's not too much, actually. It's uh, quite a uh, remarkable list. That's the good side. The bad side is we're just not achieving what we set out to achieve uh, almost at all. And this is uh, the real drama and the real uh, reason for thinking what's happening, why are we not achieving what we set out to achieve, especially since governments continue to take care of this agenda, talk about it, produce voluntary national uh, reviews uh, for what they are doing. We've had 188 VNRs out of the 193 countries. So 
why isn't the agenda working? And I think uh, that question is coming into focus. And I would say that next year's Summit of the Future, which is a rather remarkable uh, summit coming up, uh, a once in maybe two or three generation summit, will be a time for really some deep reflection about why we're not achieving what we set out to achieve. And the answer is that we could achieve what we had set out to achieve, but we don't have the political and institutional base to achieve what we set out to achieve. We've got the technology, we have the know-how, we have the global finances, we have the means to end poverty. In fact, poverty is just an anachronism in this world. Uh, it makes no sense in the year 2023. Uh, there's no deep fundamental reason for our shortfalls on any of these goals, but we don't have a system of institutions certainly at the global level, the regional level, the national level, to accomplish what we want to accomplish. And this is frustrating for the world, actually, because we feel on the one hand, we should be able to do this. And by this, I mean the things that I've talked about or the energy transformation or escaping from the growing calamities of climate change, which are very real, very serious, and accelerating. We feel we should be able to do this, and yet we can't seem to get this uh, done properly. So this, to my mind, is uh, what we should truly reflect on at this juncture in the world and think about what would it take to do what we need to do. So let me give you my own reflections on that, uh, that almost paradox in a way, clear goals, goals that have been reaffirmed, goals that governments have adopted, but goals that are not being achieved. Of course, some people might say, well, they're not really achievable. These are just dreams. These are nice statements. I would strongly dispute that. There is no reason why we should have extreme poverty in the world. There's no reason why there should be hunger. There certainly is no reason in the world why hundreds of millions of children should not be in school, though they are of school age. In fact, it's a scandal. Uh, it's not a puzzle. It's a scandal uh, that uh, this is uh, the case. There's no reason why we should not be on a path to full decarbonization by mid-century because technologies are now so good and the costs of zero carbon energy are now so competitive with the traditional fossil fuels that the transformation of the energy systems is absolutely within reach, but it's off track in terms of the actual implementation. So this is the puzzle. Let me start with some uh, thoughts about what to do about the puzzle. First, China is a proof of concept. Uh, more than that, because of its scale, it's a, a global scale part of the solution. And this is a country that in 40 years ended extreme poverty from rates of extreme poverty that in 1980, depending on what estimate one uses, range between 60 to 80% in poverty by a kind of World Bank standard. And that reached zero by 2020. Of course, China's success is the greatest success of economic development in history. So it's superlative, but it's also a demonstration of what can be accomplished. And in my view, it's a kind of roadmap also, especially for Africa right now, because what China accomplished between 1980 and 2020, Africa should accomplish between 2023 and 2063, 2063 being the 
100th anniversary of the OAU and the target date for Africa to achieve its economic objectives. So it's good. We have 40 years. That's what you need. Uh, I don't think uh, it's possible to do it faster than China, but it, China gives a kind of roadmap to how things can be done. And what the Chinese success in ending poverty demonstrates is the crucial role of a very high investment rate invested properly in three areas of the economy. The first is in people. Uh, and I'd say that's the most important. China had the most extraordinary rise of education and of health that we've seen. Uh, and on education, the number of years of schooling and the quality of schooling comparing 1980 to today is uh, absolutely magnificent. And this is the core of China's economic success that China attained actually the first ranks of uh, technological and scientific uh, innovation and sophistication in two generations from a, a country of villages after a century of upheaval, invasion, uh, and uh, instability. And in 40 years, made a complete transformation of the human capacities, especially through education. The second investment, of course, was infrastructure. And uh, Sonia and I arrived uh, absolutely to the minute on time from Shufu uh, to Beijing uh, with this wonderful infrastructure uh, of uh, fast rail. And I wish in the United States we had even one kilometer of fast rail in the whole continent. We don't have one kilometer of rail that goes at the speed that we went. We were watching 320 kilometers per hour uh, the entire way. So it was a very quick journey. And that's China's infrastructure investment. Uh, so uh, this is true of rail. Uh, it's true of the highway network, of course. It's true of fiber and 5G. Uh, it's true of the power sector. China built a modern infrastructure that is continental scale uh, in a period of uh, even less than the 40 years. And that supported this startlingly rapid economic development. And of course, the third pillar of investment was business investment because the first two were mainly governmental investments. And the third pillar is business investment. And the core of the business investment is that China had an outward oriented strategy of integrating the Chinese economy into world markets, and especially did so through the manufacturing sector, though other sectors in other places can play a similar role. But China's idea was to become deeply integrated into the world economy and to climb the technological ladder along the way until reaching not only uh, the top of the ladder, but now the uh, one of the leading innovative uh, regions of the world creating the new technologies. So. That's a starting point for me in terms of what needs to be done. And I make the comparison with Africa, uh, and I thank uh, the UN country team here for really supporting the China-Africa partnership, because to me, this is absolutely wonderful for Africa and for China and for the world. But if you make a comparison, it's quite interesting, China, in some way, maybe not quite uh, where uh, Africa, not quite where China was in 1980, but a lot of poverty, probably not as extreme uh, actually in a quantitative way as China in 1980, but still 
a large part, especially the rural population in poverty, and absolutely a dearth of infrastructure, a uh, low level of educational attainment in general, because kids complete six or eight years of school, and then many can't continue because of fees or because of uh, family need or poverty, or the government can't provide the uh, school spaces and so forth. So in this sense, uh, really an urgent need for investment in human capital, meaning education, uh, meaning uh, health uh, care and so forth. And nicely, Africa is the same population as China, 1.4 billion people, of course. The difference is the imperial powers chopped up Africa into 55 individual countries, not one of which, not even the giants, not even Nigeria, uh, not even uh, Ethiopia, not even uh, DRC is big enough economically or demographically to pull off this transformation by itself. But if you think of the African Union, like I like to do, as the equivalent of a China or an India, then you have something at scale, a continental scale, 1.4 billion people. And then I would say you have a kind of roadmap that uh, what is needed now is high levels of investment that continue for several decades, focusing on these big three areas of investment, the human side, the infrastructure, and the business development. And the key to do that is, as China did, a mixed economic system that has a strong state sector and that has a strong private sector. So truly a mixed economy and a set of institutions that can direct investment productively into the urgent areas. Now, there's a huge puzzle that stands at the center of our lack of adequate achievement. And that is how to invest this takeoff in Africa for the next 40 years. And I could speak about other regions of the world, but I'm going to focus on Africa because of the uh, relationship uh, and, and I think the, the need and uh, the, the usefulness of China's experience in this. Right now, in the poor parts of Africa, investments are perhaps 10% of GDP, of an impoverished GDP. So last week, I spoke at a gathering at the UN for Malawi. I don't know if uh, anybody from Malawi is here. Yes. So I was with the president of Takawera at a very, uh, very fine meeting uh, at the UN last week. And I noted that Malawi has an income of $500 per capita, a saving rate of zero because people are impoverished. There's nothing to save. People are trying to stay alive. The country was hit by a terrible typhoon, uh, extraordinarily destructive. Infrastructure is very weak. Education levels very low because of the impoverishment, saving zero, and with some development aid investment at about nine to 10% of national income. But think of that. What does that mean? If the income per capita is $500 per year, 10% investment means $50 per person investment rate. That is not an investment rate that's going to get Malawi out of poverty. That's an investment rate in which Malawi will continue to sink deeper and deeper into poverty. 
and the IMF has blessed Malawi's economic program because the IMF doesn't pay. Is there anyone from the IMF here? No. Okay. I would say the I would say the same thing anyway, but the IMF doesn't pay attention to these issues because it pays attention to the bottom line that the budget is balanced. If it's balanced in extreme impoverishment, fine, as long as it's balanced. And so Malawi has a program in which there's $50 per person of investment. The kids can't go to school because there isn't an adequate budget for that. There is not the domestic saving to get this process started. And then here's where I want to make the point. The international system doesn't pay any attention to any of this. Uh, it says, just don't over borrow. Be quiet. You'll be fine. And so sorry about that typhoon that hit you. So sorry that as the scientists say, that was caused by human-induced climate change by the rich countries. But don't ask them to do anything about it. They deny any historical responsibility, by the way. So good luck and try to achieve the SDGs. That's more or less the reality that we're in right now. A true global system would say, my word, first, Malawi could grow 10% per year for the next 40 years. It could, because if you're at $500 per capita, it doesn't take much to get to $1,000 per capita or $1,500 per capita. The rich countries are 100 times higher, 100 times higher, 50,000 per capita or 100,000 per capita. So the investments that are needed are not huge. So that would be the first thing that an international system would say is, we better sit down and roll up our sleeves to get this right. The second thing would be to say, we want to do what China did. So how did China do that? Well, China invested between 40 and 50% of its GDP every year. Malawi's investing zero right now because it can't save, it's so impoverished. But once the process of development starts, the saving rate will start to rise because people will get out of mere survival mode and will start to save more. But at the beginning, there needs to be sufficient financing to get this process started. For example, there is no chance for development without an educated population, at least completing, I, and I even hate to say this, I was gonna say at least completing lower secondary universally, but really completing upper secondary because in the 21st century, without at least an upper secondary education, what is a person going to do other than subsistence farming or completely informal, impoverished labor in a slum area, or be a migrant, or something even more desperate. So fund education. So your education minister was there, ambassador, and I said to her, minister, calculate the education budget that you really need. You're gonna find out that it's about 40% of GDP, maybe three times your total budget. But calculate what you really need and send an email to me and send an email to the person you're sitting next to who happened to be head of the Gates Foundation. And I said, I promise you, we're gonna fill your budget. I promise you, and I do promise. Okay. <laughs> Because no kid should be out of school in the 21st century. And if Malawi can't do it on its own, we've, we're going to find the way to do it. And I want to say to the 
executive board of the IMF, you cannot approve a plan that has an education budget in which half the kids are not, or three quarters of the kids are not going to finish upper secondary. That's impossible. That's a death sentence for a country. So the main point, ladies and gentlemen, is financing the SDGs and creating a global system in which very poor countries can finance the SDGs, middle-income countries can finance the SDGs, and the rich countries shift their financing from the unsustainable direction to the sustainable direction. They don't have a problem with the scale of finance. They have a problem with what they use it for. But for poor countries, it's the scale of finance. So I spend most of my waking hours trying to raise finance for the SDGs, because in my view, the reason we're not accomplishing the sustainable development goals is not a lack of will of poor countries or a lack of desire, I should say. It's a complete inability to get this done and a lack of solidarity of the rich countries and the poor countries and a lack of functioning institutions to ensure that children are in school and that there is really electrification in countries because you can't develop without electricity just as you can't develop without a, an educated uh, population. This is basic. And you can't leave poor people without electricity and without education say, good luck, which is what we do right now. We say, good luck, just balance your budget and don't create trouble. Don't create debt trouble. Don't create financial trouble. Don't create any other kind of trouble. Good luck. So that's the change of the world that we need. Where are we going to get the financing from? This is what the Secretary General has proposed as the SDG stimulus. And it's a program that I've worked closely with the Secretary General and with Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed on. And the basic idea is we should come up with another half a trillion to a trillion dollars a year of development finance, and it wouldn't be that hard to do. And by the way, it doesn't even have to be a grant. I'm perfectly happy for Malawi to take on a huge, huge amount of debt that would be 300% of your GDP even. If it were 40 year debt, and then you had time to grow 30 fold between now and then, because then it wouldn't be 300 or 400% of GDP. We have this optical illusion. The IMF says, don't let the debt get above 30%. So don't borrow to electrify or don't borrow to put kids in school. But that's because they have a completely static view. If you borrow for those things and then emulate China with its growth rate of 10% per year compounded for 40 years. You know, if you grow at 10% per year, you double every seven years the size of the economy. And if you do that for 35 years, your economy is 32 times larger than it was when you started. And that's what Africa is absolutely capable of with the kids in school, with electricity, with fast rail, with the transboundary infrastructure so that Africa is one economy, not 55 small economies. And that's really where the breakthrough is going to come. So I'm looking for finance. And the main two areas of finance are public finance and private finance. And on the public financing side, we have a number of institutions, our multilateral development banks that are charged with doing this. But the scale is so small now that they don't function to do what we think we're doing. You would be surprised if you haven't looked at it, ambassadors, that the total lending of the World Bank, the African Development Bank, 
the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, added up is $100 billion a year. $100 billion a year is for the poor half of the world, $25 per person. This is so subscale. These institutions should be 10 times larger than they are. And that is the first recommendation of the Secretary General, a big expansion of the multilateral development banks. There's a little problem. And the little problem is that it's not really a problem, but the United States slow walks this because to expand the banks would mean more voting shares for China, more voting shares for India, more voting shares for the developing countries, and they don't want that. And this is where one of the bottlenecks comes in, that geopolitics starts to intervene. Yes, we should have a larger world bank, but then who's going to have the voting shares and so forth? This is not a deeply interesting question, except that it stops action in Washington. So this is an example of the problem. A different area for doing this kind of investment is the Belt and Road Initiative. I am a huge fan of the Belt and Road Initiative. I would strongly encourage every country to partner with the Belt and Road Initiative and to come celebrate its 10th anniversary next month. It's exactly what the world needs and exactly good for the recipient countries and for China. It's actually a pure win-win proposition. China gets to sell a lot of infrastructure and a lot of technology. That's good. But it goes to build electricity, 5G, fast rail, all the infrastructure that's really needed. That's what economics is about, is mutual gains from trade. So this is an intertemporal trade. China finances the development of the recipient countries and the recipient countries achieve economic growth and they repay those loans when they're richer. The two criteria that I think are extremely important for the Belt and Road Initiative to pay attention to, first, the investments should be high quality, sustainable green investments. So use them for uh, fast intercity rail, use them for renewable energy and transmission grids and so forth. Second, from China's side, I want the lending to be at least 30-year maturity, not 10-year or 20-year maturity, but at least 30-year maturity, because otherwise there's going to be a lot of frustration. The debts will come due in 10 years, but the development's just getting started. So this is a huge problem with finance. It's not only the amounts, it's the structure of the financing. And you cannot finance long-term development with short-term loans. If you finance long-term development with short-term loans, you have a series of economic crises, which have given me a very interesting career because I've made a career going from country to country I realized only countries in deep crisis would have me. Uh, it's a kind of last desperation. But the truth is, these crises are what we call liquidity crises. Countries run out of money because they're maybe one fifth of their way through long term development. But the euro bond was a seven year euro bond, or the loan was a seven year bond. And by the time it came due, well, the first grader was now in eighth grade, but not yet contributing to that economic boom. So it's a little uh, premature to start the repayment cycle because uh, development is just getting started. So we need long-term financing and a lot of infrastructure. So I'm also in a campaign with the IMF to change the criteria 
that the IMF uses to judge whether countries are in crisis right now, because you'd be surprised. The IMF has what they call the debt sustainability framework. And they rate countries, strong governance, medium governance, or weak governance. Almost all poor countries have weak governance, not surprisingly, because they're always with the back to the wall. And they'd say to the weak government, don't borrow more than 30% of GDP. And I say, are you kidding? 30% of $500 per capita? Don't borrow more than 150 bucks? That's not gonna get you very far. Because I say, when I do my spreadsheet, borrow to 400% of GDP. But then as I say, 40 years of fast growth brings that way down to completely manageable levels by the time the debt is due. So the IMF has a very short-term viewpoint. The credit rating agencies, as they even admitted to me, Mr. Sachs, we don't know anything about development. What we do know about is default risks and these are high default risk countries. And I say, yes, but if they had the right development framework, and they say, but Mr. Sachs, we don't know anything about development. We just try to predict default risks. So I'm trying to argue for a long-term partnership vision, a reform of the international financial institutions, a new way of thinking about the problem, looking at China not only as a great success story, but also as a kind of roadmap for what a high investment strategy can mean for today's low-income countries, or what it would mean suitably adjusted, say, for the ASEAN region or for South American countries. Because I believe that the essence of sustainable development is investment in our future. And I don't want China to become as they're told all the time in the U.S., stop exporting to us, stop saving so much, you should consume more. I don't buy this at all. China saves a lot because it's aging fast and it wants to build up a high level of wealth. Good. But let that wealth be a claim against Malawi. It's a good bet. Malawi has a huge rate of return. By the way, when you do the calculation, the rate of return to development is just about the best rate of return in the world. I think it's comparable to uh, every one of our unicorn uh, companies. My calculation is that the rate of return to investing in Africa's development is about 15% annual rate of return, but it takes 40 years to realize. So that's the internal rate of return over a two generation effort. And I'm very conscious that the newborn today will not yield that return until they're 30 years old because they have to go to uh, through upper secondary and then four years of university at least. Uh, and then uh, by the time that they're 22 or 23, they can enter the labor market and then They'll start repaying hugely, but that takes the time. But the cumulative rate of return is extremely high. Development is a great rate of return activity if you give it the time. And so that, to my mind, is really where the SDGs are right now. We're terribly distracted, terribly confused. Our governments do not play well together. Uh, the United States unfortunately criticizes the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the best initiative in the whole world on long-term development. So not only not a proper object of criticism, but it should be an object both of praise and to say, we want to partner. And with Europe, please partner. You're on the same landmass. The Eurasian landmass needs an interconnected infrastructure. Of course, the Silk Roads was the first example of that. That's the model. 
of the Belt and Road Initiative is the Silk Roads. Okay, that required a lot of forces over a long distance. We can now have a 21st century infrastructure. So for Europe, build from the West towards the East. China will help finance investment from the East towards the West. Celebrate in Samarkand that you have connected Eurasia together, again, in a 21st century Silk Road, and let's cooperate. And I know the United States calls some leaders and says, maybe you should not be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this has happened last month in the White House and so on. Please don't do this. This is ridiculous. This isn't a game. This is our world. This should be partnership. This should be cooperation. There should be dialogue to get this right. And Europe and China should really be cooperating on getting this right. I'll say one more thing and then I'll stop. And that is that wherever you look in the world, my economic advice is be nice to your neighbors. Because economies work better at scale they work through trade and transport, and your neighbor is on your transport route, whether you like it or not. They're your neighbor. Africa, by the way, has 14 landlocked countries. The coastal countries and the landlocked countries need to be friends. We need an integrated infrastructure. And that's true of Eurasia, it's true of Africa, it's true of South America. The GuideCo initiative that I mentioned at the start is an initiative for interconnecting the energy system. It's a wonderful idea. And by the way, the engineers of GuideCo, which was created by China State Grid, are the best in the world at these interconnections because China had to bring power from Western China to the Eastern seaboard. So they've developed a lot of the best technologies for high voltage direct current systems and their management, but that's interconnection with the neighbors. So I'm completely against Cold War politics where you're on one side and you're on the other side. Come on, this is really, absolutely not the right way to think about any of our real problems. Neighbors share river sheds, neighbors share rainforests, neighbors share fisheries, neighbors share inland seas, neighbors share renewable energy potential. Neighbors need to cooperate and to be nice to each other. So as they say, look to your left, look to your right, to your north, to your south, make friends. Thank you.